to look at one of my favorite lectures, which is looking at language and identity, focusing on region. So um, as we mentioned before in this class, there's different ways to say certain things. Um, and I know that in the first lecture, I, I kind of probed or asked you some of these questions to kind of figure out what regional dialects um, you have. So a lot of linguists, we also try to do this uh, with our surveys and we and we go around and we ask people, you know, what do, what do you fry your eggs in? Or what do you call a soft drink? What do you call a long sandwich containing salami? And what do you drink water out of? And so all around the country, we can, we, and, um, and all around the world, we might have different answers to mean these things. So some people call it a creeper, a fryer, a frying pan, a skillet, or a spider. I've never heard of spider. I've never heard of creeper. So if you say those terms, please tell me where you're from. Um, soft drink is a very common, um, common lexical, uh, item. So for example, if you're from the Midwest, maybe you'll call it pop. Um, or maybe you'll call it soda if you're from Minnesota. Um, sometimes, sometimes people call it soda pop or tonic, or if you're from the South, maybe you call it Coke. Um, long sandwich, some people would call it um, a hero, a hoagie if you're from um, up north, uh, a grinder, a pole boy if you're from uh, Louisiana. Or um, what do you drink water out of? A drinking fountain, a cooler, a bubbler, or a geyser. Um, so I would call it a drinking fountain. But um, depending on where you're from, you might have different responses. How do you get something from one place to another? Do you take it? Do you carry it? Or do you tote it? Um, so tote might be something um, that's uh, particular to, to the place in which you uh, live. What do you carry things in? Um, a bag, a sack, or a poke? If you're from the Appalachian Mountains, you'll say poke. Um, and how do you speculate? How do you, um, you know, I reckon, I guess, I figure, I suspect, or I imagine? So these are just some of the examples of the regional variation that we've discussed in the class so far. So in addition to all the factors such as age and, um, you know, sex and gender and uh, race and ethnicity, region is actually a very important characteristic of uh, language because where you're from impacts how you speak. So as we've seen in the slides about um, global Englishes, you already know that there's variation among British, Australian, Indian, Singaporean, and American English. There's also variation nationally, um, and we're able to see this uh, with the United States. So even within a certain state line, you can you can kind of tell, uh, you know, what are the uh, qualities. Um, We'll discuss Southern English in a little bit, but even the types of Southern English is very different. Um, you know, if you talk about uh, the kinds of uh, Southern English spoken in South Carolina, it might be very different from the drawl of Texas. So American dialects, um, you know, dialecticians uh, look at the ways in which um, a certain speech pattern might be geographically uh, contained or based on certain social variables. Um, you know, we've looked at longitudinal studies to see, you know, where these dialects may have come from. Migration definitely has a big, um, a big historical precedent. So for example, um, as I showed in, in, um, uh, in previous slides, um, the history of the Scots-Irish uh, really resonated with um, once they moved to the United States, their, their dialect uh, became part of the Appalachian dialect. Um, so it's also indicative of a future or past growth. That means, um, you know, some of the southern dialects might be changing. So, um, you know, a lot of the regions might not necessarily be as distinct anymore. Um, that means if you go up north, it might... It, won't look as um, different as some of the other cities that you've been to. Um, and it's and really, um, the, there's lots of commonalities among different regions. Um, the biggest difference per se would be um, a difference between rural and urban. So for example, um, you know, people think of California as being, you know, everyone speaking this California surfer kind of vibe. 
but actually there's places in California which are very rural and they speak in more of a southern accent you wouldn't know that they're from California um, so you would, we would see a lot of variation even among the states um, and the regions themselves so um, you know what we will we call this kind of line where we um, indicate one linguistic change from another we call them isoglosses and so there's some key isoglosses uh, in the United States um, right now we have uh, you know the north accent and in the north accent we have an inland north a north central and then you know that differs from a Canadian accent although some parts of for example Detroit um, people sound very Canadian up there we have what's called the West accent and the Midland accent um, and a Southern accent. And like I said, sometimes the uh, inland South, kind of the Appalachian um, speech, is very different from the kinds of sounds that you'll hear in Texas. We also have, you know, New York City has its own kind of isogloss, uh, which differs from the Mid-Atlantic. So where, you know, Baltimore is considered to be the Mid-Atlantic. Um, and then also West Pennsylvania sounds very different. So even within um, state lines, you will have people from Philly sounding very different from people from Pittsburgh, for example. So lexical variation, lexical, as you remember from past lectures, just means the vocabulary. So um, something has a different lexical variation. It means they have a different term used for, for um, the same thing. So for example, um, you can see the difference here between pop and soda. Um, with, uh, you know, some, some instances of uh, people using the word Coke, right? So that's in, in the red here. And also some phonological differences. So, so phonological, of course, means uh, the way that you pronounce things. So do you say greasy or do you say greasy? Do you say creek or crick? And do you say roof or roof? Especially if um, you're talking about plural. So do you say roofs or roofs? I think roofs is kind of dying out. Um, in previous lectures, I also mentioned the term wash. And I said that if you're from, um, you know, Western Maryland, parts of Pennsylvania, maybe you'll say this term or your grandparents will say this term. And so, um, you know, wash or wash isn't so much as it is uh, regional as it is rural. So again, um, you know, we're talking less about the uh, regional we we're talking about regional dialects, but it's, you know, as we move into the future, it's going to be less about region and more about a rural slash urban divide. So some, there are some phonological distinctions that are becoming lost. So for example, uh, caught, caught. So a cot is something that you sleep in, or I caught the ball. A lot of you will probably say I caught the ball or I sleep on a cot. Um, so these, uh, what we call a caught, caught merger, uh, these are very, very similar to you. The second one is which or which, right, with a um, kind of like a, a aspirated H, which. Um, again, you know, uh, not a lot of people say which anymore. A lot of people would just say which. Um, so these are becoming lost or they're becoming more uh, similar. Um, however, the pin-pen merger is still remaining stable, as you see on this map. Uh, this is cotton call. But you'll see the different isoglosses there. Um, you know, cotton call is merging. Um, but pen and pen are not. So you'll still see uh, people who call it a pen um, up up in the blue and people who call it uh, a pen uh, down in the red. And so um, we're talking about, um, you know, the thing that you write with, right, the pen. Um, and people in the South, uh, even though it's um, spelled P-E-N, they would pronounce it PIN, like P-I-N. Um, some other isoglosses, you'll have uh, that downtown Pittsburgh. Okay, so Pittsburgh, they'll say yins uh, for as a y'all, right? Uh, and then Boston, they'll have a parking cars, as you see. So you'll 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 notice as soon as you. Um, get into a particular area that they um, that they utilize the accent. The summer dialect, just to just to hone in on a particular um, regional dialect form, you know, um, because some people say Maryland is in the north, um, some people would say Maryland is southern state, and it really depends on uh, where you live. 
Um, but a lot of people, you know, they'll go to Western Maryland and they think that they're um, hearing people from West Virginia or, or you know, South Carolina, but they're, they said, I'm from Maryland, you know. And so um, because there's so many people in the South who are rural um, and they're isolated, there have become a lot of different dialects. Um, so, you know, there's Appalachian English. A lot of people will say it's Elizabethan English, um, although Elizabethan English is, is something that's, um, you know, kind of gone. It's, it's an era of the past. So we went, linguists would not say it's Elizabethan English, even though it does have, you know, that Scots-Irish heritage. We have um, Cajun accents in Louisiana. We have Gullah. So there's, you know, Gullah is uniquely in, in South Carolina and Georgia. And so that's in, influenced by some of the African uh, enslaved people from Africa um, that were brought over. So, so there's lots of history there. Um, but one of the receding accents um, is that slow juleps in the moonlight draw favored by Hollywood portrayals of the South. So you don't really hear people say these um, words anymore. So, um, you know, this, this is a, if for some of you who are from the South, maybe you sound a little bit different from your grandparents uh, or maybe you sound the same. But that, you know, that um, kind of slow draw accent is now mostly found in the movies or among the very very um, elderly um so what they call a plantation draw versus appalachian speech right so um you know this is this is less of a draw more like a faster paced dialect so it's uh, you know spreading very fast right appalachian speech is it's very fast talking um fast talking english so actually, one of my mentors uh, for my master's program, Walt Wolfram, uh, from NC State, he says uh, that vowel shift, where the one syllable words like air come out in two syllables, um, a right, that's vanishing, right? So people don't really say a anymore. So that drawl out speech is really disappearing. Um, but there's still other aspects of Southern dialect that are that are still here. So for example, um, might could, as in like, I, I might could do that. Right. Um, so using double modals, uh, are still prevalent in the South. And you have some types of, uh, Southern phonology. So for example, um, you know, saying, um, madam saying, sir, saying, um, you know, South for South, right. I'm going to put the South in your mouth, right. Um, going for, or I'm gone for going, uh, help for help, test for test, um, ring for ring, boy for boy, car for car, and the police, so emphasis on the, on the first syllable there, so lots of different differences, uh, lots of differences, and also you'll find this a little bit, um, in a lots of, uh, AAVE, African American vernacular as well. Um, you'll have, uh, you know, these, uh, monophthongization. So, uh, ride becomes rad. My becomes ma. Um, uh, and you know, the thing about Southern speech is, um, you know, why it's so prevalent is because it has been around so long in the media, right? So, um, I like this quote from Roy Blunt Jr. He says, my father, who is surely an intellectual man, would say can't. He, he wouldn't say can't. There ain't no way, just ain't no way. You don't want to say there isn't any way. That just spoils the whole thing. So, again, this relates back to your identity. If It doesn't matter. Um, you know, they always typify, the media always typifies Southern speech as being slow or people who speak them are slow or unintelligent. But actually, you know, pe people are intelligent to use Southern accents because this, this is where they're from or you know maybe they want to um maybe they want to to utilize the accent because there's a certain familiarity to it so when someone speaks in the Southern accent it, it's kind of like they um you can really relate to them right you want to kind of just pull up a chair and, and drink iced tea with them right um and so a lot of politicians um so for example in the 2016 um, election, uh, Hillary Clinton was campaigning and, and her, um, husband was touring around Bill Clinton, um, for her president, 
actual run, and so he would automatically use um, that, you know, that accent. And so um, the southern accent was a way to kind of index a, a kind of close familiarity with um, with the everyday life, everyday people. And so, uh, you know, Blunt said there's a certain eloquence in Southern vernacular that he wouldn't want to lose touch with, right? Because there's a whole um, history and there's a whole culture um, with these with these uh, vernacular speech styles. And also, you know, there's many profession, professions that thrive on a good old Southern twang. So preachers, football coaches, people who are, you know, attorneys, litigators, they want that Southern speech because it just, you know, it, it's a... Um, it's a commodity. It sounds great to a lot of people, you know, it kind of um, makes you who you are. It's very sexy in this regard. I remember when I was turning around England, you know, I would say something and someone said, I like your accent. And I said, um, excuse me, like, you know that you're from England, right? And so this person was telling me that they liked my accent when, you know, they had um, a British accent. So, you know, it just, um, it just depends. Like movies like Sweet Home Alabama and, and um, other movies that really, uh, you know, glorify the South or, or kind of portray the South in, in kind of this, um, you know, kind of uh, a, a nice you know, homey to the people, you know, um, kind of way it kind of, uh, elevates Southern speech. And so some of the Southern grammatical terms you'll find might could, like I mentioned, negative modals, had an ought, um, uh, past participles, larnt, um, possessive pronouns, yearn, his urn, hern, orn, thern, prepositions, a quarter before eight. So I still use this a quarter before eight. Conjunctions, unless without, uh, lesson, thouten, I've never heard that. Um, and adverbs, anywheres, nowheres. You ain't getting, you know, no honey, nowhere, something like that. Um, and then some pretty typical Southern vocabulary, you'll get chitlins and grits, or I gotta go out and buy a pig and a poke, so a poke means a bag. Uh, or you'll see hear things uh, from popular songs like "Carry Me Back to Old Old Virginia." So, based on these features, do you think Maryland is a northern state or is a southern state? Um, and you can voice your your opinion on the uh, discussion board. So, how do you pronounce this phrase? A lot of you, if you're from Baltimore, you'll probably pronounce it just like this person. Um, and so there was a lot of, uh, this video generated a lot of, um, a lot of views because it was characteristic of what was called a Baltimore accent. And so earn, earn, and iron, earn would, um, would be typical of uh, a Baltimorean. So what do people in Maryland actually sound like? There's a, a really funny um, Baltimore Sun did a, um, covered a story in which um, the late, late show James Corden couldn't say uh, Maryland, right? The same way as um, someone from Maryland would say. So there's different parts of Maryland, as you probably know, Western Maryland, um, the Capital District, Southern Maryland, Central Maryland, Eastern Shore, and each part has its own kind of dialect. And so you'll be able to see the accents of Maryland here. Um, they took a, they take a walk around Baltimore and kind of ask people, you know, what do you think about the Baltimore accent? What do you think about the how about them O's, right? Um, and so they and then this is an episode of uh, Thirty Rock where um, they also make fun of uh, her Maryland accent for saying O. Oh. And then also, you know, um, Michael Phelps, who is from Baltimore, whenever he um, was in the Olympics, uh, during a national anthem, they would yell out, oh, right. And then, you know, he laughed and I laughed, but everyone else was like, I don't understand. Like, why is he laughing during the national anthem? Right. And so he did this because he, he understood that there, you know, there was a, um, in Baltimore, O oh, means something very different. And so you have some very popular terms, right? Hun is one cafe hun, um, natty bow, right. Um, or the O's. Um, so there's lots of lexical features down by the ocean, right? 
Um, so the O is really, really pronounced further forward in your mouth. We call that O fronting, right? Shin, right? So this is something that's uh, very typical of Maryland. And here are some other accents of uh, Maryland, particularly looking, particularly looking at the the Eastern Shore. So Eastern Shore, there's a Delmarva accent. You know, people who say um, oil it sounds like oil, or frog sounds like frog, right? Um, a lot of fishermen, they'll you know they'll they'll say um, you know I caught five fish. And so this is very typical, you'll notice. Smith Island, people on Smith Island uh, have been known to speak a little bit differently than people on the mainland. Um, so, you know, what, what, what do these accents have in common and how do they differ? So how does Central Maryland dialect differ from the, uh, you know, Midlands or the Western Maryland or the Lowland South dialects? Here's some examples uh, from the Baltimore, I think it's the Baltimore Language Wikipedia page, in which I helped to edit one time. But um, the elimination of the schwa is often eliminated from some of the from some of the words. So for example, if you have if you're saying the word Annapolis, sometimes you'll say Annapolis or cigarette, it's just cigarette. Company, it's just company. You know, just get rid of that extra schwa, that extra unstressed vowel. Um, you'll have an emphasis on the uh, latter part of your your word. So, you know, instead of Federal Bureau of Investigation, you'll say Federal Bureau of Investigation. All like all, like I said, um, iron and Irish become arn and arsh. That's something called, um, I think it's called eye collapsing. Um, you know, mirror becomes mirror or miro. Uh, liar, wire, fire is lar, war, and far, you know. So, um, you know, here's a very Maryland joke for you, but why were the three wise men covered with soot? Because they came from afar, a.k.a. a fire. Um, so, yeah, some Maryland regional humor for you. Maybe Michael Phelps will laugh at that, maybe not. So, again, you know, like I mentioned with the southern dialects, uh, when people speak in this kind of term, they're using... Um, the language to index not only where they're from, but also how they feel about where they're from. So, for example, if you're from um, the Western Shore, you know, where they, uh, the Eastern Shore, sorry, where they say um, oil for oil, but you say oil, right? That's probably you um, maybe don't really relate to the Eastern Shore that much, right? Maybe you grew up in a small town and you wanted to get out. And so, you know, um, the way in which you adopt the regional features of where you're from really index how you feel about that place. So, you know, maybe you sound very Maryland-like, maybe you don't. Um, so, you know, linguists, they, they study how people are, uh, or sorry, they study how people speak, um, you know, by asking the same questions that I presented to you at the beginning of this PowerPoint. But do linguists have a good, you know, do they know, are they aware of, um, you know, linguists know, but are people are the people aware of you know how they talk? Um, yeah, they they know, right? They know. Um, that's why they exist. That's why you know the um, people are able to say, oh yeah, like O's. You know, that's why Michael Phelps was able to laugh at his, um, you know, at people saying oh like during the national anthem, right? But um, you know, people are not that great. People. Um, Americans assign people to north, south, east, and west. So they're not able to say, uh, look at a map of America and say, oh yes, people from the eastern shore definitely say this. Um, they'll usually say, okay, um, you know, they'll they'll say um, people in the uh, in New York sound like this. They have awlessness, right, from the uh, Bill Above study. They'll say that uh, people in the dip uh, in the south they'll have um, you know they'll have a lack of diphthong so you know they'll say ride for ride um, but you know they really can't really tell anywhere else they know California right they'll know um, you know hella this or like but uh, you know that's that's um, that's something that's you know whatever is portrayed I think in the media um, is really what people can pick up on. 
And so Dennis Preston, in 1986, he he did a study in which he showed people a lot of, um, he showed people a map of the United States, and he said, okay, draw me these lines, draw me these isoglosses, tell me, you know, where um, people are based on their accent, right? And so, um, you know, for the most part, people were able to label um, parts of the United States depending on their speech, but, um, you know, it's, it's a very, it's very difficult. Um, for example, uh, this was a German who labeled the United States, um, by state. And he was like, okay, I know California, right? You know, New York, um, you know, Mountain Mama, take me home, right? West Virginia, uh, Florida, right? Texas, 100% sure this is Texas, but everything else, they're not sure. They kept labeling everything Ohio or Oreo. Um, so, you know, it's all about how, um, you know, these accents are represented in the media and how, how much people pay attention to the kind of dialect features in the United States. So, um, you know, there's lots of language attitudes, right? And so language attitudes also determine, um, how people are more willing to keep their accent or lose their accent. Um, but this is the top 50 sexiest accent. United States came out in 2020. So let's see what's the sexiest accent of America is the Texan accent. Okay. So they said the Texan draw was the sexiest accent. You know, Matthew McConaughey, the way that he talks is just so great because it's a Southern accent. It has strong R's, plenty of howdies, right? So remember Bill above study about New Yorkers? And how he went into the Macy's and he went to all these different stores and he said, um, yeah, where's the women's shoes? Oh, it's on the fourth floor, right? Uh, and he knows that the richer the place was, they would they would say um, there are. So they would say, oh, it's on the fourth floor. Whereas he went to a Klein shoe store and they said, oh, it's on the fourth floor, right? And so they said, yes, Texan was the number one sexiest accent because of the use of strong R's. But the least sexiest accent was also New Jersey, right? Um, coffee, and they said that it was dropping the R's, really. So, so, so this uh, this post um, post vocalic R is still very sexy, right? Um, if you're looking at the different features, you're able to kind of uh, understand, you know, what is desirable. Um, can even come down to a simple pronunciation, right? So Texas is sexy, but New Jersey accent is not. According to this informal poll that did not have any sort of, um, I don't know, any sort of statistics as to how they poll people, but, you know, very valid, I guess. Just kidding. So where's Baltimore? baltimore as they called it, was number 20. Okay, number 20 on the list. Actually, from the year before, it dropped two places. So um, they said that, uh, you know, the Baltimore residents were pronounced mirror as mirror and water as water. Um, but the key feature is it's fronting back vowel. So it's O, oh, right? Or it's the goose would be like geese, right? Uh, so they said that, okay, you know, not as sexy as Texas. Um, but, you know, not as bad as New Jersey. So we're kind of in the middle. We're kind of in the middle of the, of the sexy accent spectrum. So these attitudes, these language attitudes, they can lead to pride, right? So a lot of you, a lot of you are probably feeling very prideful right now. You said, yeah, 20 plays, go us, right? But then a lot of people are very shameful about it or have some linguistic insecurity. So remember the lower middle class speakers in LaBeouf studies and in Treadgill studies. They said that, um, you know, the lower middle class was the were the ones that were trying to speak the standard um, language that they so they could uh, because they aspired to be in the next social class. And the same thing. So maybe, you know, some of you might want to uh, pick up a Texan accent, right, to be considered sexy. Um, you know, Southern speakers, highly sociable, they had, uh, you know, but they, um, a study looked at how they had a low status, right? Um, so he said, okay, they're very friendly, but they're not very wealthy. And then other studies looked at language attitudes and said, you know, according to a New Zealand study, uh, the American accent was the best. Okay. So, you know, maybe, uh, keep up that American accent. Um, but of course we don't know, you know, who they, who they interviewed or, how the study was controlled, so I, I wouldn't put too much thought into it. So for your discussion questions, I want you to take the New York Times uh, dialect quiz. 
uh, and also, you know, kind of discuss. Were you surprised by your result? What answers stood out the most for you? What list goal items stood out the most? What are some local accents that you've noticed? What are some words that strike you as particularly Maryland-like? Uh, words that mark someone as not being from here. And also, what features do you think carry prestige in Maryland? So, so these are some good, um, good ideas to consider. And I will see you on the discussion board.